Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our ongoing series of presentations of program evaluations by participants in our PEQA program evaluator, co evaluator course. Uh, this is an ongoing series, and there will be subsequent presentations by other participants as they complete their program evaluations and their final papers. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, there'll be many fine, fine uh, additional presentations. I want to do a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, if you look in the chat progressively during the presentations and during our session today, uh, we will there will be a link to instructions about getting a CRC credit, or well, one CRC credit for this presentation. Uh, it was also in the slides that some of you may have been watching while you were waiting for this to start. Um, and it will be in the email that you receive tomorrow, which is to ask you to evaluate uh, this presentation. And at the end of that, there's a place for your name and email address if you would like to receive a CRC credit for this particular presentation. Also in the chat, um, uh, Jen will be progressively putting in a link to uh, the three PowerPoint presentations that you will see today. So that will be there as well. Um, we will have a live question and answer, answer session after all three presentations. So if you have a question for one of our presenters, please put it in the Q&A box, which is on your menu bar. For some, it may be at the bottom. For some, it might be at the top. But please write your question there. Aaron Nierenhausen will be moderating the question and answer. And again, that will happen after uh, our final presentation. One last piece of business. The session is being recorded. Uh, we will re record the entire hour and a half of both the presentation and the questions. Uh, that will eventually be posted to the PEQA site, PEQATAC.org. Uh, so if you have friends that might be interested, um, you can refer, you can send them there. And again, uh, if you have colleagues that wanted to see this and also might need a CRC credit, you can watch the recorded webinar uh, take the answer the evaluation questions and get a CRC credit for that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kate Anderson, who's our project director for the PEQA Technical Assistance Center, and she will take it from here. Thanks very much, everybody. Great, thank you, Terry. I appreciate the introduction and welcome to uh, the presentation. I'm, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Um, one additional housekeeping item, um, just in case you're interested, anyone who would like to use the closed capture, um, the sessions today are being live captioned. Um, and so just click on the closed caption CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you, it should be able to, the subtitle should be able to pop up immediately for you. Um, it is my pleasure uh, today to introduce our three panelists. Uh, Deborah Collard from the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired, Brittany Downing from the Indiana Bureau of Rehabilitation Services, and Claudia Pettit uh, representing Michigan Rehabilitation Services. Uh, these three PICO participants have, um, have just done a phenomenal job and, and we're thrilled to be able to share the culmination of their hard work and effort and commitment by the VR programs uh, with you today. So with that, I would like to, well, we will start with uh, Deborah Collard and Deborah works again uh, in the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired. Uh, her capstone project um, that she'll be sharing today is entitled A Closer Look at Vocational Rehabilitation College Training Services um, at the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired. And with that, Deborah, I am going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. I appreciate it. All right. I believe I'm sharing my screen. Is that what you all can see right now? Okay, good. <laughs> We're good. It's right okay, there. great. Um, so before I get started, I just want to say a quick thank you to a couple of people. Dr. Sue P. at Michigan State University. Um, Sue was my capstone mentor for this project, and I really appreciated all of her insights and her recommendations. Um, it was wonderful to work with her. I also want to thank Erin Nierenhausen and Terry Donovan, um, the whole PEQA team, of course, but I'm, I'm calling out Erin and Terry because they were involved in keeping us on track 
with the online courses as part of this certification, and I really appreciated their efforts. Um, and a thank you closer to home to our commissioner at the Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired, Commissioner Ray Hopkins, and Deputy Commissioner Willisha Gaines for supporting my efforts um, through this whole certification process, and I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, so as Kate said, we're going to talk about taking a closer look at vocational rehabilitation, college training services at the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired. Also, I'll be referring to it as DBVI throughout the presentation. So by way of a little bit of background, um, in federal fiscal year 2017, DBVI continued to serve an increasing number of individuals through our VR program. Historically, we know that DBVI expends a significant amount of VR funding on college and training services, maintenance services, and rehabilitation technology. We also at this time, like many other state VR agencies, um, were implementing WIOA and learning all of the new things that came with that. So um, thinking about new services that might need to be provided and in terms of pre-employment transition services, thinking about new ways um, that funding was allocated and what some of the funding requirements were. So what's on the screen right now is a graphic that illustrates um, some trends in our spending. And this graph represents federal fiscal year 2009 through 2017. Um, the dark blue bars represent spending, VR funds expended in college and training, and the light blue bars represent maintenance. So really, this what I wanted to illustrate here is this trend. So the upward spending trend that we were experiencing and as the college and training spending increased, so did the spending on maintenance. So because of all of these factors, DBVI VR leadership was really interested in taking a more focused look at some of the college training services, considering our current college training policy, um, also considering some outcomes of individuals who receive these college training services. So the purpose of this capstone study was really twofold. The first goal was to examine the population of individuals who receive college training and determine if we could see an effect on employment outcomes um, as compared to those who did not receive college training. So this was a comparison of the two larger groups. This was not an individual match type of comparison. Our additional or second goal was to consider other state VR policies around college sponsorship and um, just learn if there was, see if there was anything we could learn from a review of those. So in setting up the framework for this study and thinking about our evaluation questions, we were of course considering those two populations that I talked about, individuals who did receive college training services and those who did not. So we wanted to ask, who are they? What are the differences in these two groups? What can we see when we look at them um, in comparison? Could we identify any relationship between college services and VR outcomes? And similarly, could we identify any relationship between receiving college services and quality of employment? So starting to look at um, some variables like wage, hours worked, and occupation. And then for our secondary goal, our evaluation question was really pretty basic. So what can we learn from review of other state VR agency um, policies around college training sponsorship? So in order to examine the populations of individuals who receive college training, we looked at existing program data for our quantitative analysis. We extracted information from our case management system, which in Virginia we use AWARE. We also looked at RSA 911 data files. And further parameters for data selection were VR cases closed in federal fiscal year 2011 through federal fiscal year 2016. 
and that those closures happened after um, an IPE was developed, or in other words, that individual did receive VR services. Some of the initial variables that we included were individual characteristics like age and gender, types of closure, occupation at closure, and some of those quality of employment um, data points like hourly wage and hours worked. For the qualitative analysis, reviewing other state PR agency policies and documents, really we were just focused on the college training services and sponsorship. Um, we looked at information that was publicly available. We wanted to stay pretty close to home geographically and, and look at states bordering Virginia, as well as state VR agencies that were similar in size to DBVI. Um, and in Virginia, we have two state VR agencies, our sister agency, which is the general agency DARS, and then of course DBVI, which serves individuals who are blind and vision impaired. So in this analysis, we wanted to make sure we looked specifically at similar agencies. And we were able to review um, policies from four agencies who serve blind and vision impaired individuals. Okay, so in starting to look at our data um, and going back to our evaluation question, so who are they? Who are these two populations? A total of 1,799 participant case records were reviewed for this study. Um, what's on the screen right now is a table with three columns. And the column on the left is describing some of the individual characteristics that we looked at. The column in the middle represents um, those individuals who received college training services. And the, col the column on the right represents those who did not receive college training services as part of their VR program. So both groups were fairly similar in terms of gender, race, disability benefits, and disability priority status. However, a slightly higher proportion of individuals that were white SSI recipients and determined as significantly disabled were more likely to receive college training services. And so some of those figures are um, for the percent individuals who were white, 63% um, received college training and 58% did not. Okay, so considering our, oh, I'm sorry, I need to go back. I skipped, skipped a major point here. Um, what we did note was among these indiv individual characteristics, age at application was significantly different. So this first row here. So the average age for those individuals who did receive college training was 35.4 years old. And for those who did not was 45.2. So th this is the characteristic that we identified as significant. Okay. Continuing with our evaluation question, when we're looking at these two populations, do we see any relationship between VR outcomes and quality of employment types of factors? Um, this table also has those three columns, but now we're looking at individuals who were employed um, when their case was closed or who were rehabilitated. So we see that 64.2% of individuals were employed after they closed their case and they received college training services. And of those who did not receive college, 69.2 were employed. We see similar values for the hourly wage between these two populations and for the weekly hours worked. So when we considered the factors from the previous table, and noting that the average age at application was significant, we decided to go, go ahead and break down these two groups by ages, so further divide those populations, and then revisit our, re -eval our evaluation question. And what we find here is that for individuals who are 24 or younger and receive college training, they were twice as likely to be employed when their VR case was closed 
than those who did not receive college training. So that's a 60% rehabilitation versus 30% for those who did not. We also see a significant difference in their hourly wages. Um, $13.75 for those who did receive college training and $9.49 for those who did not. This gap begins to close a little bit for individuals age 25 through 40, although the figures are still higher for those who did receive college training services. And then when we move on to age 41 through 64, we start to see that leveling off a little bit. And those individuals age 65 and over, we actually start to see a reverse effect here. So those who were closed without receiving college services had higher rehabilitation rates and higher hourly wages. So we're starting to think there are other factors involved here. And back to our evaluation question, when we're asking about any relationships between college services and occupation. So again, looking at the two larger groups, we see those who received college services had occupations at closure, pretty typical of many that you would expect to have some type of college in their um, background. So occupations like teachers or management analysts, social workers, program directors, those kinds of things. And we also see that for individuals who did not receive college services as part of their VR program, their occupations were typical of those who may not require any type of college or training, such as janitors or cashiers or dishwashers. What was interesting here is there's an overlap between these two groups as well, where we saw um, occupations that you would expect to find in one group or the other. Things like um, customer service rep or manager or lawyer. So these findings made us think about other factors as well, um, things that we might like to include in future studies, things like education level and application, um, previous employment experience, also other services received. There are many factors, but um, this was reinforced by this overlapping group here. All right, when we moved on to our second goal, um, considering the, the qualitative review of some other VR policy, and we asked the question, what can we learn from a review of other state VR agency college training policies? We were able to review 16 state VR agencies. And as I mentioned before, four of those were specifically serving blind and vision impaired individuals. It was noted that 11 out of 16 or 69% have college training sponsorship limits, have in-state requirements, or other state specific incentives or programs for college training sponsorship. It was also noted that six out of 16 or 38% require initial college training to occur at the local community college level. And five out of 16 or 31% have in-state requirements or other state specific college sponsorship guidelines. So this review really demonstrated that each state is using a variety of policies and incentives to address, to address the potential cost of these college services. And DBVI had similar policies in place. So as a first step in considering potential policy changes, the DBVI um, VR leadership determined to review existing policy and revisit it with VR staff and managers to provide training that would ensure the policies were understood and implemented as they were written. So what are some of the implications for practice or future research um, that we can think about from this study? So the qualitative and quantitative results were used to inform DBVI leadership regarding how to best utilize agency resources in order to deliver these college training services. 
This study also showed that younger individuals were more likely to receive college training services at DBVI and also more likely to have benefit from these services. We know that college training is a high cost service, not only for DBVI, but for many, if not all state VR agencies. So we recognize the importance of continuing to monitor these findings. Um, as well, in the future, we would like to include additional variables, things that I mentioned like previous employment experience and education level at the start of the program, even things like length of time and service and consider other VR services that were received in conjunction um, with these college training services. And as many state VR agencies are now well entrenched and well informed with our WIOA performance measures, we would like to include some of those in future studies and also include some of the current quarterly RSA 9-11 data files in the analysis. It would also be interesting to include data from other states in this analysis. And this would help us determine if these results are specific for Virginians who are blind and vision impaired, or if other states are seeing, um, are having similar findings. Additionally, including this data from other states would increase some of our population and subgroup numbers and potentially allow for our different, more robust analysis and possibly different findings. So what are the lessons learned from this study or lessons reinforced? And there were many, um, but I wanted to share these three with you because they, they really stuck out for me as important. So when you're starting or initiating any kind of study or evaluation like this, it's critical to understand the questions that the decision makers are asking and understanding how the information is going to be used. Um, so will the information be used for budget development or for compliance issues or um, to strengthen or edit policy or assist with training? All of those questions you should be thinking about in the beginning of the study. And in fact, I think parts of this, of the information provided to DBVI and VR leadership were used for many of these um, different purposes. Additionally, when, when we are considering the VR program, we know that an individual's, an individual's VR program is a complex and dynamic thing. Um, so when we're talking about one type of service or one type of training, it's important to remember there are many factors to take into account and all, as many as possible need to be incorporated in, in the analysis. Um, specific elements that we would like to include in the future, as I mentioned, are of course, um, previous employment and education level. And finally, when working with a diverse data set or several different types of data sets, it's important to spend time initially in the beginning of the project, making sure you understand what the information means and organizing it in a way that's most appropriate um, for the analysis. And this lesson will be particularly important as we start to incorporate some of the new RSA 9-11 um, quarterly data files. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Um, as Terry and Kate explained earlier, we are going to handle questions at the end. And I look forward to hearing any questions you may have. Kate, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Deborah. Excellent presentation. Um, and I love these presentations, I think, as much as everyone, even though I've had a sneak peek at the um, the information, the results, and kind of, you know, being involved along the process, uh, sometimes a little behind the scenes. I, I feel like I always learn something new hearing the evaluator present their own, uh, their own project and own data. So thanks so much, Deborah. Now we are going to move to Brittany Downing. Um, and again, Brittany is with the Indiana Bureau of Rehabilitation Services. Uh, Brittany is going to be presenting her capstone project on case services reporting 
meeting guidelines for WIOA and supporting documentation. And with that, welcome, Brittany. I am going to pass the baton to you. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Kate. Uh, as she said, my name is Brittany Downing. I'm with Indiana, just for kind of a recap. And I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen here. If you're able to see the presentation. And is everyone able to see the presentation now? Yep. You're good, Brittany. Okay, just wanted to make sure. That, that comfort feeling, you know. Um, so what my presentation was on or my research was on is on the changes with WIOA over the last few years and also how that ties into those common performance measures. And so my goal today is just kind of talk about how these WIOA changes have impacted our agency and we wanted to take a closer look at it to see how that impacted not only our data and reporting but also our counselors and our staff as well. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about what we learned from doing the research and at the end what we did to improve our data and improve those common performance measures. And so this first part just talks a little bit about the background. So over the last several years, um, RSA has revised the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 to include those Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Uh, so that WIOA, those WIOA changes. And a lot of those changes highlighted uh, different ways or additional data elements to collect um, in regards to participant barriers, as well as performance reports to identify those measurable skill gains and credentials. And also we started uh, reporting on follow-up program participants. So looking at those program participants that had closed for certain different reasons and looking to see if they were able to maintain that long-term employment um, and looking at their wages and their sustainability within uh, those quarterly case reports. And so with these WIOA changes, I look at it as we're, we're really just kind of focusing on how folk rehab along with other agencies, partnering agencies are able to collectively work together uh, to help these same groups of participants to get um, better paying jobs, better resources and be more competitive, um, not only in the short term, but also being able to sustain long term employment. And so the research. Uh, that I focused on was looking at those common performance measures and assessing how Indiana's data system, our training and our business processes that we used and applied um, adhered to these changes and how effective they were in looking at our data. I also wanted to gather some information from our voc rehab counselors that are implementing these processes to see how comfortable they felt with the training that was provided um, and also just how overall those WIOA changes had impacted their daily job duties. Uh, one quote I put here at the bottom because I really like it, it just says, um, during this transition to WIOA or any type of transition, um, particularly when we're looking at the challenges to try to lean out those processes, I think it was really important to uh, let staff know that we're, we're not looking at staff or those changes, we're looking at the processes, not the people um, as far as that process of evaluation. So when we're evaluating how this looks, what our data looks like, um, what their feedback is on it. We're looking at how this process is in place and if there's something that we need to do to improve the process. Um, so the purpose of the study identified three separate goals. Uh, the first one was to determine the challenges with implementing WIOA within our VR agency. And I'll talk a little bit more about that piece of it. Um, it's also to assess the effectiveness and the understanding of WIOA collaboration and also those data requirements for staff. And goal number three was to determine the effectiveness of the current business processes, training, and that resource, and those resources to collect that data. And so that first goal um, really was a, a major challenge because our legacy case management system um, was a system that we had for almost 20 years. Um, and so it was just a homegrown system. So there was a lot of cost associated with uh, updating that system to be able to collect those additional data elements. And so just just that cost of the system, uh, we kind of, as an agency, looked at what our options were, and we ended up navigating to a new case management system, AWARE, uh, which allowed us to kind of have that shared cost with those WIOA changes, uh, be able to report that information independently as an agency instead of relying on a contractor. Um, so we did, uh, by looking at these WIOA changes, we did make some changes within our agency to improve our ability to capture this information. And step two is just really just trying to understand our WIOA partners and making sure that we're able to work together with those partners and collectively 
report the data and share that information with one another. And the third, we're just wanting to see how effective and efficient this process is, um, and then what types of additional training might be needed or resources to help our staff. And so the methods used uh, in this research study was the research design focused on using a survey, uh, using Qualtrics, if you're familiar with that, it's a survey tool online. Um, so I developed a series of survey questions and sent this out to our staff. Um, the staff that were targeted was our 171 vocational rehabilitation counselors all across the state. So each counselor um, that had that title received an email with the survey link identifying, um, asking them to complete the survey. And the data collection technique was the initial survey link was sent on 311 uh, with a survey due date of 316. So giving them about five days, I didn't want it to get lost in the mix, uh, but at the same time, making sure that they had adequate time. I did send a follow-up reminder on 316, just requesting they complete the survey by the end of the day. The validation of the study out of 171 surveys that were sent, 110 were completed by our staff. So this provided us a response rate of about 64.3%. Uh, the survey tool link was available to all of our counselors for five days, and the results are limited just to Indiana Vocational Rehabilitation Services. And this is a screenshot of the results. So I broke this down based on uh, MSGs, measurable skill gains, credentials, and employment verification, um, and then each of the individual pieces. So I'll kind of talk about those, those goals. So looking at goal number one, um, as far as measurable skill gains, we had about 33% noted they had difficulty obtaining responses from participants, and 32% noted difficulty with just obtaining that documentation. So we see that there was about two thirds of our staff are saying they're having some kind of difficulty getting this MSG data. In regards to credentials, um, it, it pretty much mirrored those same responses saying they had about 36% had difficulty obtaining responses from participants and about 33 had difficulty obtaining that documentation. And so some of the challenges they spoke of was once that participant was able to get that credential or that degree and get in the job field, it was hard to get them to send that documentation to them. And I'll kind of talk about uh, some of the reasons we kind of discovered why this might be. And lastly, the uh, obtaining employment information, 40% noted that they did have difficulty obtaining responses from participants. Um, so being able to get that documentation, that check sub once they get that job. Um, and then there was 25% that said they didn't have any issue at all. 7% um, also noted some other features such as uh, difficulty entering the data in AWARE, and I think that contributed to the transition to a new case management system during this time period. And so for follow-up um, on these closed cases, we did have about 90% of our counselors uh, stated that they had difficulty contacting the participant. Um, a lot of the issues that they ran into was being able to contact or locate despite maybe multiple attempts, and that was about 34% of our counselors. Um, about 29% of our counselors said a lot of times the phone number and or the address was coming back as invalid, or about 28% of participants opted not to provide that follow-up information. And so this has been um, kind of a true struggle for some of our counselors with getting that information. And when we look at the overall um, length of time as a VRC, and then also just the overall WIOA impact, um, one thing that I noticed is that the majority of our counselors were between, that 33% were between two and four years on the job. And then the next highest would be 32% of the counselors have been there less than two years. And so looking at that data, um, I'm seeing you know, about two thirds of our counselors have been with the agency for less than five years. So knowing that these are some newer counselors, um, they're taking over newer caseloads. So you can definitely identify where not having a rapport with a closed case, because maybe you are a new counselor on that case and you're trying to contact someone for that wage follow-up information, that wage and education information, um, but they've maybe never met that person before. 
And thinking that, you know, about two thirds of our counselors are relatively, relatively new within um, five years or less. Um, as far as the overall WIOA changes on the job, 39% noted no change. And so some of those new counselors may not experience any change at all um, because they've, they've never known the job prior to WIOA. Uh, we did have 28% noted a negative change, 6% uh, noted a positive change, and 9% noted uh, initially this was a negative change because there was a lot of increased training um, in order to understand these new WIOA common performance measures, um, but then it ended up being either a positive or a neutral change once they, change once they got adapted to that. Uh, we did get some other comments and some staff mentioned that primarily they felt like these changes took time away from being able to work um, with the active cases and being able to work directly with that client and that collecting the additional data was affecting their overall joy of the job, where they felt like they were doing more document and data as opposed to that face-to-face -face interaction. And another growing concern um, that I've seen a few times in the responses was the number of cases requiring follow-up was continuing to grow. Um, so once this uh, follow-up was introduced and maintaining that follow-up for six quarters after exit, um, they seen that as they continued to close cases, that that follow-up list every quarter that they were contacting continued to get larger and larger. Um, and for some staff, that seems very overwhelming with already an active full caseload. And applying uh, the training overall in the process related to the responses. So looking at that goal number three, um, the responses regarding staff feeling knowledgeable about what documentation was needed for the system in WIOA. Um, we had about 36% said they felt comfortable, they felt knowledgeable, um, and looking at that, it's probably some of our older staff, um, so that one-third of staff that have been here five years or more. 27% uh, noted they had some difficulty with the MSG's credentials and follow-up. 16% uh, said they had difficulty just with the MSG's and the credentials, they felt comfortable with the follow-up, and then 12% had difficulty with just the follow-ups after closure. So you can see some struggles um, with different things, but overall about a third of the uh, survey group did have some difficulty with just understanding that process and how that works in the new case management system. Uh, there was a 9% that recommended that had some other comments as well. Um, and some of those comments were that it was too time consuming, um, they didn't feel comfortable, uh, that the documentation was correct. So maybe they had some documentation, but they didn't know if it met RSA standards or requirements. Um, and then also just feeling like they needed time to catch up on cases. So they may have uh, just took over this caseload as a newer counselor um, and just needing to catch up on all those closures follow-ups as well as getting other documentation needed. And so just to condense the overall findings, uh, the overall findings indicated staff had difficulty with obtaining that documentation, finding that time to capture those data elements, and then also receiving responses from participants after case closures and follow-up. Uh, so one, one problem with uh, the follow-up closures was just a newer counselor, so they may have not met that participant. Um, but something else that we identified was making sure that when we're taking applications, uh, that intake counselor is letting that participant know uh, that we do do these follow-ups after closure. And we like to see how they're doing and how, how their job is. So just letting them know in advance um, that the agency would be doing this. And I think that has um, already started to show improvement on these follow-ups. Overall, the recommendations from the study was to provide additional training on techniques and documentation needs. So looking to see about one third of staff are still uh, needing some clarity on that. Um, the second recommendation was to reallocate some of those responsibilities to assist with managing time and caseloads. Because uh, some of those responses came back just not having the time to do it, needing time to catch up, or maybe feeling overwhelmed. And the third recommendation was uh, looking at future endeavors to seek data exchange interfaces to obtain documentation and reduce that frontline administrative work as possible. So we do, uh, we are required to report on measurable skill gains, credentials, wages after closure, and any credentials after closure as well. Uh, but maybe this isn't something that we necessarily have to have the field staff do. So if there's an interface or another agency that can get that data for us and we can handle that behind the scenes, that'll definitely help um, alleviate some of those job duties 
and also help with that time management. So of course, um, doing the research and seeing the results and having the recommendations is just part of it. I think that's when I think of PQA, I think that's the program evaluation piece of it. Uh, and then the other piece of it is that quality assurance or that quality improvement. And so this is what I'm going to talk about next is what our agency did in response to this research. So uh, once we identified there were some things that needed to be done, uh, we did take a look at the additional training that we needed. Um, so our approach was we provided additional training. We did a one hour webinar with our staff to assist with that training. And then we also followed up with providing guidance reference sheets, so just quick one pages um, that our staff can use to reference this information and not require documentation. Um, so it kind of spells out for them what measurable skill gains are um, and what a measurable skill gain would be with certain education goals. Uh, we also provided a uh, reference sheet for closure follow up as well. And so they've got these three guidance reference sheets when they're working through the cases. Um, something we also did is we advocated with our case management system aware um, for changes within the system um, so that we could have reminders for our staff. So a lot of times our staff are carrying around 100 plus participants on their caseload. So just remembering um, on a quarterly basis to reach out to that participant and make sure we get those uh, documented measurable skill gains or documented credentials and things like that. Um, so our case management system did update um in the in november last fall and so they made some updates to make this a lot easier for our counselors to trigger reminders to let them know hey um, this participant should be reaching a measurable skill gain at this time can you review this case and reach out to them uh, the second response we did is we reallocated some of those tasks to other roles to assist so uh, getting that that response and that feedback we see that uh, there was a lot of extra responsibility and data collection on our counseling staff. And so we did reallocate um, some of those tasks to our secretaries and our case coordinators to assist with making those calls for those closure follow-ups. Uh, we also created a WIOA follow-up letter. So when the secretary or the case coordinator contacts a participant um, for WIOA follow-up and they're unable to answer, uh, they'll leave a message, but they'll also send them a letter requesting, you know, just verifying their wages, seeing how things are going, and if any education credentials were obtained. And that also accompany, is accompanied with a self-addressed envelope, so hopefully we can get a response back from the participant in that way. Uh, the third is uh, we're actively pursuing data sharing relationships, so the long-term goal is to be able to obtain this wage and potential education information behind the scenes and maybe pull off a lot of that responsibility from our staff um, and then be able to put that into the system on the back end um, and then they could look at that information validate that with the participant um, so that would be easier for both the counselor and the participant as well and so we're working on finalizing the swiss agreement information so that we can get that uh, swiss data from out of state we currently have wage data for, uh, for our state with indiana um, but that extra layer of piece would be that Swiss agreement data. Uh, once we have that in place, then our participants would, uh, our, our counselors would just need to verify that data with the uh, participants. And then if there was any self-employment, that would be additional information needed. But it would definitely lower that responsibility. Uh, we are also pursuing a data sharing agreement. Uh, we found that there is um, something in our state, and apparently it's in a lot of states, and it's called a management performance hub. And it's an agency that works together and it collects data from different agencies and is able to share that data across the agencies. And so uh, we are working with them, uh, finding that they have data from Department of Education and higher education, as well as some other agencies that could benefit with being able to track those MSGs as well as those credentials. And something that we decided to do internally is once we and updated these processes based on the research, uh, we also wanted to look at the data and review and see, okay, now that we've provided this training, are there other changes taking place within this data? How is this data looking? Is there additional follow-up we need to do or clarification? And when we uh, looked into the data, one big thing that stood out uh, was realizing that our education data Prior to WIOA and these common performance measures, our education data was collected at application for our participants. And so a participant would apply and 
let us know where their education level was at that time. Um, and this education information was static in our previous case management system. And then if folk rehab assisted with education services, those were usually collected and captured on the plan and also on the case note. Um, but that application education uh, was never normally updated. And so something we realized is that a lot of open education goals came from our legacy case management system into our new case management system, uh, which was causing some confusion for our staff. So they're getting these reminders to look and see if this participant um, obtained a measurable skill gain. However, this is a participant that um, was not attending school, was not being supported by school, um, so it caused some confusion. Uh, so we did do a project to help identify those education goals that had not had a MSG reported in the last performance year. Um, so we called it Operation Education Goals and MSG Reviews. Uh, there was over 2,000. Um, the number exactly was 2,088 open education goals that we found in the system. Um, and we found that uh, of those, um, they did not have any MSG reported in the last year. Um, so we'll, what we did is uh, we did a six week project. So on a weekly basis, we ran those open education goals without an MSG. And then we also ran a report to see how many MSGs were reported. And so this graph right here shows um, the progress over that six week time period. Uh, where we started out with over 2,000 open education goals without MSGs. And as staff began to review them, um, they would make that determination, is this a participant that is no longer in school and it's an old education goal that was never closed? Or is this a participant that's still actively in school and we need to follow up to see if any measurable skill gains were obtained? And so as you can see, um, those without an MSG and an open education goal, so those attending an education according to the system uh, is in blue here, and the MSGs are in orange. So as you can see, uh, as they're reviewing those open education goals without any measurable skill gains reported are decreasing, and we can see our measurable skill gains are increasing. And so now we can go into the new performance year for 2020, um, with clean data, because I think that that's very important. So about 2,000 of these goals, uh, we found about one third of those were actually goals um, that were old, some of them back from 2002 even, where we had captured it at application, um, but it was never jotted back into the system to say this was actually not an open education goal. I was just, I, the participant didn't know the end date, so we didn't put an end date on that goal. Um, so it was really looking at cleaning up that denominator for that common performance measure. Um, and then now as we move forward, making sure they still understand um, about tracking those MSGs and those credentials. And then now we're seeing that numerator. So we'll see kind of the fruits of the labor in our performance year 19, but truly with our clean data and our clean goals will be performance year 2020. And this is my contact information. So if you have any questions on this, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll be on the slide till the end. So I think we're taking questions after the third presentation. And thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brittany. I really appreciate uh, you sharing your project and um, you know both the program evaluation components as well as the quality assurance and how Indiana, uh, the Indiana and a Bureau of Rehabilitation Services is using your findings um, and providing rapid response in terms of um, solutions and um, improving quality uh, in your program immediately using the data. So that's really, really fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thank finally you. And I, now, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to, I was going to say thank you. And I appreciate the PICWA team um, for all the support and answering the questions. And, and it's really um, allowed us to expand. Uh, our director is great at being innovative with approaches. And then uh, we also have, you know, the leadership team with support and WinTech. So it's worked out really well. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, and finally, uh, Claudia Pettit uh, is with the Michigan Rehabilitation Services and Claudia will be presenting on her capstone, which is entitled the effect of the effect of benefits counseling on increasing knowledge of social security work rules and work incentives. And with that, Claudia, I am going to pass the baton. Brittany, you need to stop sharing. So Claudia will be able to share. So at the top of your screen, 
if you could hit the stop sharing button, that would be great. Perfect. Okay, I am I sharing now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure because of Brittany's. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Claudia Pettit with uh, Michigan Rehabilitation Services, and I um, did my capstone on the effect of benefits counseling on increasing knowledge of Social Security work rules and work incentives. The background um, for this um, project was that many um, customers who receive Social Security um, benefits benefits may lack motivation to obtain and maintain employment due to negative effects on benefits um, and a customer's ability to maintain and obtain employment may be impacted by the lack of knowledge about natural supports and access to community resources. So MRS began a pilot study with three local offices and three disability networks and Center for Independent Livings to provide comprehensive benefit planning services to MRS customers. Um, benefits counseling was provided by trained community partner work incentive coordinators and work incentive practitioners to improve the long-term outcomes for SSI and SSDI recipients and to increase participant knowledge of Social Security and other community resources. So the purpose of this study was to evaluate the pilot project. Um, some of the background and the reason for the project was um, we took some preliminary data and we we were shown that MRS in um, performance year 17 and 18, 29% um, of Social Security beneficiaries achieved employment outcomes versus 44% of non-beneficiaries. Um, and the adjusted rehab rate um, was 48% for beneficiaries as opposed to 64% for the general population. Um, of those with a successful outcome, 24% um, earned below minimum wage, um, and 60% earned between $9.25 an hour to $11.99 an hour, um, while other half of non-SSI, um, SSDI beneficiaries earned more than $12 an hour. So there was, there was a, a wage discrepancy, and we wanted to see um, the hours and the wage um, areas and where we could help people with Social Security benefit from increasing their hours and their income. Um, they also worked, 55% of um, SSI and SSDI beneficiaries also worked less than 21 hours per week um, versus 17% of non-beneficiaries worked less than 20 hours, 21 hours per week. Um, the purposes of the study was to evaluate the effectiveness of benefits counseling to provide provided to Michigan Rehabilitation Service customers who receive Social Security benefits. The research questions included, what are the specific best practices in delivering benefits counseling to customers? What does benefit counseling improve, does benefit counseling improve a customer's knowledge of Social Security work rules? Does benefits counseling improve a customer's knowledge of work incentives? Um, the procedures of the project were the following. We reviewed um, benefits planning related studies and we did a literature review. Um, we developed evaluation procedures and, we, and pre and post test questions in collaboration with Disability Network and Center for Independent Living Administrators. We provided a series of trainings about data collection to the staff providing benefits counseling. Um, we collected the pre and post tests from July 1st to 2019 through February 29th, 2020, and then we analyzed the data. Each participant was given a pre and a post test. The test instru instruments consisted of three sections, individual characteristics, knowledge of social security work rules, level of knowledge and intention to use work incentives and benefits. Um, these are the characteristics of the participants. A total of 82 Social Security recipients participated in the study from July 1st, 2019 through February 29th, 2020. 24 of the participants received supplemental security income only. 40% 40 
40 participants received social security disability only and 18 participants received both SSI and SSDI. We also did characteristics of the benefits um, that each, all the participants received in each of the groups. As you can see by the graphs, um, Medicaid and Medicare were the highest benefits received for all the groups across the board. And the second highest was um, a food assistance program, SNAP. Um, we asked what their work status was. Um, most people were not working. Um, the highest um, level of people working um, when they got benefits counseling was SSDI recipients at 45%. And most people were, work, were not working SSI, 75% were not working, 82% of SSDI were not working, and all um, was 65% were not working. We also asked if they were full-time or part-time working. And as you can see, most people were not, um, did not have full-time positions. If they were working, it was part-time. And again, SSDI um, participants had the highest part-time working at 43%. We also asked if they were not working and seeking a job or not working and not seeking a job. And most of the participants, 56% of all the participants were not working and seeking a job. And um, only a very small percentage were not working and not seeking a job. Um, those were all pretest questions. Um, at the end of the benefits counseling session, the benefits planner um, gave the post test to the customer. We have three different post tests, one for SSI only, one for SSDI only, and one for both. Um, of all the questions, um, I would say it looks like everybody answered most of the questions correctly. The lowest um, percentage of correct questions was for question two, which was the break even point is the dollar amount of total income that will reduce the SSI payment to zero for a particular case. So some people didn't understand that, but it was still 83%, which is, which is a good percentage. And then the highest number correct was 95.8%. And when working and receiving benefits, I am required to report monthly earnings to Social Security. For SSDI only, um, the the it was it, the lowest performing question was if I earn less than eight hundred dollars a month in twenty nineteen, it will not count towards my trial work period. So people didn't understand the monthly limit for trial work. Um, that was 84.6%. And again, the highest correct um, percentage was for question one, which was when working and receiving benefits and required to report my monthly earnings to Social Security. For both SSI and SSDI, we did a combination of questions that pertain to both for people receiving both. Um, and again, the highest performing question was about re reporting monthly earnings and the lowest performing was um, regarding the trial work period. Um, we also asked um, the knowledge of incentives pre and post test. So if people understood what incentives were available through Social Security um, and, to, and available to go to work. Um, The highest per percentage of knowledge change was for expedited reinstatement. Um, that was a 66% knowledge increase. Um, the second highest was freedom to work at 58%. And the third highest was impairment related work expenses at 55%. The two um, knowledge percentage that actually was a decrease was subsidized housings for section eight. And that was a 4% decrease in knowledge after benefits counseling and the plan to achieve self-support um, was a 23% decrease in knowledge. We also asked after the benefits counseling um, session if they'd be interested in using the work incentive benefits now that they knew what they were or understood what they were. 
and 63% said they would use Ticket to Work, 48% said they would use expedited reinstatement, and 45% said they would use Freedom to Work. Those were the highest um, utilizations. Um, and then um, the lowest really was um, they will not use um, ERWI. Um, so the key takeaways of the study, um, where we had 82 um, participants, um, Medicaid and Medicare were the most received benefits of all the participants. 65% were not working, 34% were working, and 56% were not working and seeking a job. 64% of, of all recipients were concerned over losing <clears throat> excuse me, health care benefits and losing cash benefits if they increase their income or working hours. 64% said they didn't want to lose health care benefits as a reason for not working. 96% of all participants understood they needed to report earnings to Social Security while working. Expedited re reinstatement and freedom to work had the most gain in knowledge among the participants. Plan to achieve self-support and subsidized housing both had a decrease in knowledge. And the mo most likely use incentive would be ticket to work with 63% stated they would use the incentive, followed by expedited reinstatement 48% and trial work period 41%. And both knowledge of work rules and work incentives increased overall after receiving benefits counseling. Um, MRS is continuing to collect data um, through July of this year. And we're also going to be looking at um, work intentions, um, employment outcomes, and satisfaction of services um, to continue the study. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. This is Erin, and I I'm going to introduce myself to everybody here. My name is Erin Nierenhausen, and I work with um, the PEQA project and have provided support to Claudia, Deborah, and Brittany throughout the course of their uh, coursework and capstone project. So with that, I'd like to go into a question and answer time period. And I'm going to take a moment to um, ask a question and then open it up to the participant to answer it and we'll kind of go volley back and forth in that fashion. So first off, I'm going to start with Deborah. I'll give you a second to unmute. But I would like it if you could um, d please define college. Were only four-year institutions included in your study and did it include short-term certificate programs or IPSE for those with developmental disabilities? Great. Well, thank you, Erin, and, and thanks to the participants who asked those questions. Um, so college is defined as um, how, how college and training is coded in AWARE. Um, and I, I know we don't, we don't provide VR services based on AWARE. AWARE is just our case management system. Um, so the short answer is yes, other institutions were included besides just four-year colleges. Um, but institutions were included based on how they were coded. So I didn't go back through and check every, every um, case or every case file record that was coded as college and training to determine the variety of types of institutions that were included and in terms of that second question um, about a specific type of certificate i'm not sure but i think that is post wioa language and all of the information that we looked at was really pre wioa it was from um, federal fiscal year 11 through 16 and also our population of individuals who are blind and vision impaired may be different and, and may have different types of training and certificates coded within our system than some other general agencies. So I know that's not a, a complete an answer and it may not answer all of the questions, but that's what I have for right now. And um, if you wanted, to, if those individuals wanted to follow up with me and, and ask a more specific question, I'd be glad to do that too. 
Fantastic. Well, and I do have a couple questions here. Um, actually, a follow up is how are you getting documentation that meets WIOA for successfully closing clients using self employment to reach their job goals? Okay. Actually, um, no, I apologize. That's yeah. for Brittany. I was like, so I will go back. <laughs> I will go back. So then to add while I have you on, Deborah, mm -hmm. um, another question that came up specifically for you is you mentioned extending this analysis with the WIOA based RSA 911 data. Mm -hmm. You said you considered analyzing the WIOA performance indicators. Mm -hmm. Have you queried UI wage records on these exiters from fiscal year 11 through 16 to see if they continued working? Excellent question. And no, unfortunately, we have not been able to do that yet. But that is certainly something that's on our radar to go back and look at the UI wage data that we have. Perfect. Great question. Perfect. Thank you. I am also going to ask you one more. I think we're going to have time for this. So would you, would your agency conduct a follow up to see continuing success? And if so, what would you do for continuous improvement and policy issues? Well, yes, as I mentioned, we'd, we'd really like to conduct some follow-up studies. Um, and in terms of how would we incorporate those into continuous improvement, that's the kind of information that I would leave up to our BR leadership. So I would just provide them with the information from the studies and really kind of leave it up to um, some of our VR decision makers for that. Perfect, Deborah. That's all the questions I have for you specifically. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Great. Thank you. Brittany, Great. I'm going to put you on the spot. I have a couple questions for you. The first okay. one I'm going to ask you, actually I have several, and I also have one for Claudia too. But this, the ones I'm going to ask, um, I kind of combined a few. But uh, starting out with one question that asks about VR counselors following up on closed cases. It's a two-part question. What proportion of their closed cases are your VRCs expected to follow up on? And during what time frame are they expected to follow up or are these follow-ups expected to occur? What is the purpose of the follow-ups? Uh, the purpose of the follow-up is to determine um, if a participant is continuing working. So the employment wages piece of it, uh, that second quarter and that fourth quarter after exit. And then the second part of that follow-up is to see if they've earned any credentials uh, since they've been closed. And so what we use in um, our aware case management system is there's a, an array of closure reasons that would require follow-up for at least six quarters after exit. And so we flagged those cases based on those closure reasons and it generates a report for our staff. And so we took that piece off of the counselor. So the counselor will still review it, make sure it's being done. Um, but we do have our case coordinators and our secretaries making those calls. Um, it needs to be done at least at a minimum of quarterly, but we recommend doing it monthly because um, usually there's about 10 to 15 cases on a monthly basis, depending on the office and the size of the caseloads. Um, and so they can do that at that point, or if they're falling behind or there's some staff vacancies, then they can do it at least at a quarterly basis. So we do have that updated information for our RSA 911. Fantastic, Brittany. Can you say more about BRS or how BRS uses Indiana UI wage records for reporting this data, and how is BRS approaching MSG and credentials with policy and training of counselors? Um, as far as with the wage data, we do have an interface with DWD. So they send us wage data, I believe it's on a monthly basis. Um, and so we do get that information for anyone that is employed in the state of Indiana. And so that information is in our case management system and is viewable to counselors. So when the case coordinator goes into the system to complete follow-up, uh, the first thing that they do is they look to see if, they, if the participant had an open education goal. And if they did, then they can um, inquire further about that open education goal. So if we see at exit, that participant may have been in um, extended studies for a nursing program but that goal was still open. That's something that that case coordinator will talk with that participant. I, I see that whenever we were closing your case, you were ready for closure, but you were still in this training program. How, have you progressed in that or how are you doing with that? Uh, the second piece of it is we'll look at that wage data. So we'll determine if we did get wages from DWD um, from that. And so if we did get wages from DWD, that means they're working in the state. And so they'll just validate that information. I see you're still working at Walmart making $7 an hour. Is that information correct? And so that is what we report to RSA. However, uh, we do have a lot of bordering states. And so having that Swiss wage data will be help extremely helpful for those. Um, but 
since we don't have SWIFT in place at this time, our staff are required to contact them if we don't see any wages reported and get that wage information specifically and put that information into the system manually. And then as far as our MSG, oh, sorry. And then as far as our MSG training, uh, we do have a guide. Um, it actually walks through the specific steps. So if you pick an education goal in AWARE, um, what that education goal is that you select, and then it has the MSG potential in one column. So if you pick someone with a high school education as their education goal, it'll show what measurable skill gains can be obtained with that. So that would be a high school diploma um, or completion of that year. And then it'll also talk about those credentials and how to report that in AWARE. And then we also have a column that shows those documentation requirements as well. And it kind of walks through each education goal. So going from high school to college to a master's level or some of those other programs that are non-certificates, uh, non, uh, but still credentialed. Wonderful. And that's definitely something I would share with other states if they're interested. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Brittany. I do have one more mm -hmm. question for you. Uh, with difficulty in entering data into AWARE, what does your agency do to, to communicate with Alliance as a stakeholder in the evaluation process? How well do you connect with AWARE folks to continuously improve your process as data has informed the issue? Um, we generally, the first approach is we'll uh, send a support ticket to AWARE, and so that way it's tracked and there is a number tied to it and we do get a response from them based on that support ticket. So we have uh, where hosts our system. And so every two weeks we have meetings with AWARE based on whatever support tickets we have submitted. And so if we sub submit that support ticket, we'll talk through the problem. Um, and if it's something that the system doesn't currently do, uh, they call that core AWARE functionality, uh, we will say we wanna make a suggestion. And so they will send that up to their development team as a, as a suggestion and they'll review it and see what they can do to make it a little easier. Um, we also have a co-op group. So all the states that are using the Aware Case Management System, which is about 40 states, um, meet on a monthly basis. And so we have a list of suggestions. And so we talk collectively, how do you approach this problem? Um, our, our staff are saying this. And so there may be some kind of adaptations or changes in our process that we can make to improve it. Um, and if not, if these other states are also having that issue, um, then we will go back to Alliance and say, hey, we talked to other states that are also having this issue, just wanted to, to bring this to your attention that it's not just an Indiana problem. Um, and that seems to help get that, those changes moving much faster. Wonderful. And one last question that came up that I actually asked Deborah that was supposed to be for you is, how are you getting documentation that meets WIOA, I apologize, WIOA for successfully closing mm -hmm. clients using self-employment to reach their job goals? The self-employment we have, I'd have to look at the documentation, but usually those are those self-employment wage information. Um, and so they can have uh, wage sheets where they have verification of how much they made that month and the monthly tracking of expenses. And so it depends really what their supported employment or what their um, self-employment is, if it's a small business or something like that. Um, but there's actually a couple different identified credentials that you can use. And I believe on that one, I'd have to look again, um, but I believe on that one, if you can't get any of that final documentation, you can have a case note detailing your conversation with that participant and their wages to verify that. But again, Wonderful. that's a, a reference sheet that we've got created. So I, I'm welcome to sharing that because I know uh, it took probably a couple months to navigate all that with a team of uh, individuals as well. So. Well, thank you, Brittany. I appreciate your time in mm -hmm. answering these questions. I have a couple questions also for Claudia. So give Claudia a second to okay. unmute. Thank you, Brittany. All right, Claudia, I have a couple questions for you. Could you please say more about how roughly 25% of SSA beneficiaries' employment outcomes could be less than the minimum wage? I'm just, and the question, the person who asked the question stated that they're just not sure they understood that part. Does, okay. And oh. then I'll ask more. Okay, sure. Um, I think it might have been unclear because that was the current. So when we pulled the data, they were below the current minimum wage. So um, Michigan had raised their, their minimum wage to 925 and now we're not 965. And so those individuals were below the current minimum wage. So that's how they were closed like appropriately at the time. But Michigan has raised their minimum wage um, pretty much every year for the last few years. And so when we ran the data, 
we looked at are they below what the current minimum wage would be. Oh, fantastic. Thank but you for answering that. In addition to the, within that same question, the uh, question was asked, does MRS provide benefits counseling in-house or use providers other than CILs? And have you thought about studying impact of this on, or the impact of this counseling based on provider type? Um, yes, so we do, per, we, do um, um, we do offer it with other vendors. Um, this study specifically was um, for trained certified um, providers of benefits planning. And, um, and with the CILs, we don't have any um, certified rehabilitation counselors right now who, are, who could provide that service, so that's why it's an outside service. Counselors provide um, general overviews of, of benefits counseling for customers, but if they need a more in-depth um, review or they need to really look at all of their benefits, um, that's when we um, refer out. Um, and we have looked at how are we going to use these studies to see if we can um, use the parameters of this to have um, specific qualifications for vendors? Um, so are, would we require everybody to be a certified, trained benefits planner in order to provide the service? And so, um, yes, it can be extrapolated out to other vendors. That's what we're kind of working out now and looking at the results and seeing how we can um, um, impact the field and, and make those changes. Perfect. Thank you. And then Claudia, I do have one more question. Do you think the reason people stated they would not use a work incentive after benefits counseling was due because of how the information was presented of it or if it led to confusion, whether or not it led to confusion, or do you believe their understanding of the work incentive is causing them to not want to use the incentive? Oh, that's hard to say um, because you know, this was done over um, several several offices with several benefits planners. So even though they're all trained and certified, some, some customers may have been confused by the presentation. So it's hard to know if they were more confused by the benefits planning. Um, like the PASS piece, the knowledge went down. And I think when you start hearing about um, PASS, it gets more confusing sometimes. So either the knowledge went down and I think they were like, I'm not gonna use that because I don't understand it. So maybe the more they knew a little bit more about it, they're like, I don't understand it, so I'm not gonna use it. Um, but I do think there were um, incentives that people were like, like expedited reinstatement. People didn't know about it, you know, and then now they're like, oh, that's a great, you know, that's a great incentive. So I can't really extrapolate about why they would or wouldn't use the benefit because we didn't ask them why. Um, we just asked them, well, so I can't really say if it's because they're confused about it or um, they're just not interested in using it or returning to work. Fantastic, Claudia. Thank you. That is all I have for questions from the three of you. So I appreciate your time, not only in presenting, but also in responding to the questions from our participants. With that, I'm going to hand this back to Kate. Fantastic, thank you. Um, well, and I hope that uh, everyone that joined us today, I hope that you all uh, thoroughly enjoyed these presentations as much as I have. Um, I know I man mentioned this earlier, but um, I learned so much with and, and from and through our participants. Um, each capstone project is uniquely designed um, uh, by our PICO participants but the, and implemented in individual state VR agencies. But I find that um, really all of the completed capstones to date and those that are coming here in the next several months um, are meaningful and applicable across state agencies. So I think that's one of my favorite features about PICO is that we're learning a lot from and with each other. Um, before we close this out today, a couple of reminders. Again, if you are uh, could complete our evaluation um, link, which we'll be sending out to folks um, following the presentation, that would be great. And then um, you're also eligible for your CRC credit um, for participating today. And so if you're looking for the CRC credit, don't forget to fill that out. Um, I would also like to take a moment um, and ask you all to join me in a virtual round of applause to congratulate Deborah, Brittany, and Claudia on successfully completing the PICWA program, both the online coursework and their capstone projects. They are now officially PICWA graduates. 
Um, and given that we are living in an online world right now, uh, we don't have our commencement um, graduation ceremony in person um, as we normally would. Uh, so we will be shipping their uh, framed certificates of completion um, to, uh, to them and uh, they can probably display them. Uh, hopefully again in their uh, office, work office, but you know, for the time being in your home office, that works just fine too. So congratulations, job well done. It has been uh, just absolutely our pleasure working with you uh, through this program. Also, um, I'd like to thank and recognize again, Dr. Sue P at Michigan State University. Sue does a beautiful job uh, coordinating the capstone projects, connecting early with our participants and really kind of cultivating that process and getting each of our participants connected with their capstone mentor. Um, uh, which then provides that guidance and help uh, and support through through the capstone design development and implementation. So thank you very much, Sue, for all of your work um, with the capstone projects. I would also like to uh, thank and recognize the entire PEQA team. We have such a fantastic team behind the scenes that's really working closely with participants. Uh, we meet every other week and um, just trying to troubleshoot and figure out how we can best support participants in moving forward in the program uh, towards successful completion. Um, I saw a number of our PICO coaches are joining us online today. We have certainly Aaron and Terry, um, also Darlene Grooms, Christine Johnson, and Deborah Homa. Um, and we have a full cadre of capstone mentors as well. So in addition to Sue, um, Mike Leahy, Malachi Bishop, Tim Tanzi, Bill Hoyt, Hervey Sivak, Todd Honeycutt, Scott Sabella, Andrew Ney, uh, Hanjan Ku, and Gina Chun. So um, there's a big network behind the scenes that really wants to, has, wants to support and we see, have every interest in, in ensuring success with our participants. So thank you to all. Of course, thank you to uh, the funding and su ongoing support through the Rehabilitation Services Administration and our project officer, uh, Douglas Shu is just a pleasure to work with. Um, uh, it, and the entire RSA team really uh, handles this in a collaborative fashion. So we, we truly appreciate the support. Um, and finally, before we sign off, I, uh, I see there have been a couple of questions asking about the PowerPoint presentations. Yes, the materials, the capstone materials, um, will all be available through the PEQA website, and we have a capstone hub. So the uh, Deborah, Brittany, and Claudia's capstone information will be uploaded onto the capstone hu hub here um, in the very near future. We just want to double check a few um, accessibility features for you before we upload materials, but the PEQA website is peqatac.org and dot, dot com, com will work as well. So pequatac.org or pequatac.com. Uh, um, and the PowerPoint presentations from today will also be available. I see that Jen had sent a link in the chat feature. Um, and again, we will double check um, accessibility on the PowerPoint presentations and make those available to you as well. So with that, thank you everyone for a great session today. Stay tuned. We have more PEQA participants who will be finishing up in the next several months. And if you enjoyed the, the content and the information today, um, uh, please join us for our future sessions. Uh, and again, continue to check the PEQA website um, as the capstone information will be available there as well. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.